Hello, and welcome to Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Before we begin, please hit the like button if you like this video and subscribe to my channel if you want to support me. It really does help. You can also join my Patreon. We have a big goal there and I will talk about that at the end of the video. This is an issue we are going to discuss multiple times. As many of you may know, there has been a lot of talk about the very problematic troubled teen industry lately. But what you might not know is that Utah, my home state, where I live now, is the epicenter for the troubled teen industry. This is a billion dollar business, and my own best friend, who some of you have met on Patreon, Travis, spent years working as a transporter for one of those programs. Every day, Travis would get up and drive to Las Vegas and pick up a kid at the airport who had basically been kidnapped in the middle of the night by the youth program. Travis would then drive that kid here to St. George from Las Vegas, where they would be searched, redressed in camp attire, and then blindfolded. Travis and a partner, there were always two transporters together, would then drive this kid out into the Utah wilderness to meet their group and their counselor there in the woods, where they would stay for three months, six months, a year, depending on the situation. A few weeks ago, a new Netflix series was released and it's called The Program. I'm sure many of you have seen it. It is a horrifying documentary and talks about a school for troubled youth in New York State. At the end of the series, the story makes its way back to Utah. And as I was researching and writing this episode, I opened up my local paper's website and saw that the man who used to run these Utah programs, the ones that are discussed in the Netflix special, wrote a letter to the editor on that day to my paper. Now, this is something you won't see if you don't live here in St. George, and I'm going to share it with you in the next episode in this series as we discuss this incredibly controversial subject, one that has come to the forefront of our culture and our curiosity because of none other than Paris Hilton, someone I never thought I'd actually say this about, someone I feel quite sorry for, and someone that I'm actually proud of because she is using her fame to draw attention to the horrors that occur inside these troubled teen programs. So again, this will be part one. I am going to go through these programs kind of one at a time in this series, but today we're going to start with an overview and then an interview with my friend Travis, who is going to tell you exactly what it's like to work inside one of these organizations. On a coming episode, I will feature my oldest daughter, who worked for years at Diamond Ranch Academy, another program that has come under some very serious scrutiny in the past few years. This is the first episode of my new series, Troubled Teen Program Scandals. I'm your host, Stacey Lee. Let's begin. The origins of TTI, which stands for Troubled Teen Industry, date back to a cult called Synanon that started in the 1950s. We will be covering that cult on my cult playlist. Synanon was a drug and rehabilitation center turned crazy religious cult in the 1970s. In the decades that followed this beginning, the troubled teen industry blew up. It's now estimated that between 120 to 200,000 kids are in some sort of TTI program at all times. For decades, these for-profit organizations have flourished making money hand over fist, charging fees only the rich and famous can pay when their kids begin to stray from what they believe is the straight and narrow path. If the kids' families cannot pay and the kid is getting into trouble with the law, the state will often pay for the child to enroll in a TTI program. Now, when I say these programs are expensive, <laughs> The programs the state pays for start at around $7,000 a month. The private pay clients are paying tens of thousands of dollars a month for one child to enroll and be housed with one of these programs. Here in St. George, Utah, there are more of these TTI homes than I can even count. In fact, when I applied for my liquor license at my restaurant in 2008, we almost didn't get it because there are two troubled youth homes within a mile of my restaurant's location. And they part of the liquor licensing here says you can't be anywhere near kids. It's, it's Utah. It's, don't get me started. 
but they're absolutely everywhere here. They look like corporate buildings, but they're surrounded with either electrified fences or very tall fences with anti-climbing devices at the top. In 2006, a book was published that first brought negative attention to the troubled teen industry. The book is called Help at Any Cost, and it was written by Maya Solovitz. This book was really the world's first inkling that there was a problem with the troubled teen industry, and although the book caused some buzz, it didn't change anything. The fact of the matter is there are a lot of very rich and powerful people who don't want the industry changed. They want to send their kid off to a place where, frankly, they just don't have to deal with them. And these schools serve that purpose. Again, we will do a deeper dive into what goes on in these programs as we talk about them one by one, with each program having its own episode, each of the bigger programs having its own episode. But today in this outline, we're going to talk about the fact that there is a lot of abuse that takes place in the TTI. The trouble always begins with conflict between parents and their child. Many times the child has mental health issues and instead of getting those treated, the child is branded as out of control and shipped off to a facility. Many times the child is experiencing sexual identity issues and because their parents don't want to be bothered to learn anything about that complicated issue, the child is shipped off and out of sight, out of mind. Some kids have eating disorders and some have substance abuse issues. There are different kinds of programs inside the troubled teen industry. There are residential schools like the one that you see in the Netflix documentary and like the ones that are here in St. George. The kids actually go and live at the school. It's, it's more like a prison. But then there are programs known as wilderness programs. And today we are going to focus on getting to know what goes on inside a wilderness program. As you would expect, as with any industry, there exists a wide spectrum of goodness and badness within the wilderness programs. We're going to talk about both. And like I said, you're going to hear directly from my friend Travis, who worked for one of those programs for many years. My son-in-law also worked as a counselor in a wilderness program. And and I know you do not know this man, but believe me, he is not the kind of person who would ever stand by and watch anyone be treated poorly. He would never have anything to do with that kind of mistreatment, let alone abuse. So I do know that some of these programs, while harsh, are not abusive. Do the kids feel abused? I'm sure they do. But are they actually being abused? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I don't consider being fed and counseled camping outside and being forced to hike every day abuse, especially when you're someone who is doing dangerous things as a kid and you need to be removed from your surroundings. Some people might consider those things harsh. I do consider it harsh if you're making someone hike to the point that their backpack is rubbing skin off of their body, to the point that they're dehydrated and passing out. Like I said, there is a wide spectrum of what goes on in these camps. They're not well regulated and that is the problem. Not all of these wilderness camps are just camping and hiking and feeding and counseling. There are some terrible ones. Even in the better camps, there are some problems. There are stories of kids that grow up and have claustrophobia for years because of the way that they're forced to sleep. We'll talk about that. There are kids that say they weren't given enough protein, that they walked, like I said, until their backpacks rubbed their skin off, that they were forced to hike in the extreme heat. Those things are all very concerning, but you also have to remember there are staff members doing exactly what the kids are doing and sometimes more. So it is a very extreme situation. Whenever I can bring you guys a take on the stories we are all interested in that not a lot of other creators can bring you, that's what I'm going to do. I know a lot of the same stories are regurgitated in the true crime community and the dark stories community. So I'm always going to try to bring you a take on it that's different when I can. So today I am bringing you that different take, a direct take from someone who has worked in that industry directly with these kids, with these therapists, with these CEOs, with these programs. So now we're going to go to my interview with Travis and then we will come back and talk about that a little bit. I worked as a transporter in a wilderness therapy group for seven years. I got up at various times, drive to the office, meet with a partner because there was always two people involved at all times. Then we would drive down from St. George, Utah to Las Vegas, Nevada to the airport to pick up a client. Sometimes they were adolescents, which means they were with two transporters bringing them to us or we had a lot of adult groups where they'd just be over 18 and 
show up at the airport by themselves and we'd find them. Some of the adolescents would show up with their parents. Some of them would be what they would call transports, or they called snatch and grab, which would meet at, with the parents of the kids at their house and go and wake them up and take them out of bed and bring them to us. Then we would load them up, bring them back to St. George, usually take them to our office to take all their belongings and gear them up with everything they need, backpacks, clothing. Then we'd always go to a doctor's appointment for a complete physical and get that all taken care of. And if they needed meds or anything, we'd have our nurse at the program would package all that stuff, have that ready for us. Then we would go back and then we would take them back to the office, get everything all, and then we'd get them back in the car and we'd start driving them out into the field area. And when we got going so far, we would actually have them take a bandana that they got and make them blindfold themselves for the majority of the trip so they didn't know where they were going. And that was kind of a safety issue. So if they had the tendency to want to run away, they have had no idea how they got there or where they came from, where they were going. So in all the years I went, we had quite a few runners, we'd call them. We'd always find them within five or six hours, except for one time, one client who was, I believe, yeah, he was an adolescent, actually made it back to town. And then got went to the library, got on the computer, and we had him within 20 minutes after that. And back out they went. Um, yeah, one time we dropped a kid off that was really combative and got him to the group and like field staff was there meeting him and we had to stay right by him because he was, you know, there was, I think they might have been wanting to tell him because it was later in the evening that they had to take his shoes because all the adolescents, they kept all their shoes at night when they slept. So they wouldn't have them to tendency to run and the kid had turned and punched me in, my, punched me in the face. And we had a system they called PCS, which was positive control systems that we were trained in to take him down and get him in a restraint hold. And that's what I ended up doing with him. Most of the kids all had their own sleeping bags and they'd set up their own tarp for a tent, unless if they actually ran or if they were on watch for suicide watch or something like that, then they would have staff sleep on them. So they'd call them what a burrito. So they'd put a tarp down, have the kid in a sleep bag, and they'd throw the tarp over and then staff would sleep on each side of the tarp on top of them to keep them so that they would know if they tried to get up and take off. Program I worked with, they had, I mean, they didn't have gourmet food, but it was, you know, they were living out in the sticks. So they had a lot of tortillas, peanut butter, bananas, tuna fish. I mean, they all had really healthy, it was healthy food. And then every once in a while, I think one night a week, they'd had meat night where they'd cook either chicken patties or hamburgers for them or something like that. but. Yeah, I mean, they're living out of a backpack, so that's basically what they were, you know, fed. They didn't have any refrigeration or anything like that out there, so. Okay. Some days they hiked, some days they didn't hike. Sometimes they just sat around and did crafts or, I can't remember, they call them hard skills. They learn how to make a fire with the, you know, sticks and stuff like that, or... The therapist would go out once a week and staff change and the therapist would stay there overnight with, they do sessions and I mean the field staff was pretty well trained in therapy and they kept really good records of everything and I mean I was never spent a night out in the field because I just took them to and from so I was never actually with the groups for more than you know 30 minutes at a time so I never saw any kind of physical abuse anything. The program I worked with had a excellent, excellent positive reviews and you know they actually did. I, I noticed people, so when they were finished with the program, a lot of times if their parents didn't show up to pick them up, because usually when they finished the parents would come and they'd have the parents go out to the group and stay a night with them and see how everything goes and then they'd bring them back if it wasn't that and we'd go pick them up. And we'd have to bring them back, you know, and get them showered up and everything, take them to the airport so they could fly home. I seen a lot of positive change in a lot of clients that they had. It was very well known, the program I worked with, with the Hollywood elite. There was quite a few well-known actors, children there. 
entertainers. There was a lot of kids coming from the big cities like back east, New York and that. And it, was, it wasn't a cheap program. It was really expensive. It was a minimum of 35 days at an average, I think, of around $500 a day. So it wasn't cheap. And the, the adult groups, I mean, it was like parents saying the kid was felling, felling out of college or something. So they'd give them an ultimatum that they were going to cut them off or they'd go do this program and see if they could change their attitudes. On the holidays, they'd t make a feast. So they'd have turkey and all that for Thanksgiving, Christmas, that kind of thing. We'd take out what we called a backup position, which would be taking out the water. And you'd take water to different locations and the, a cooler full of their food or whatever to where they would hike to different areas. And on the Christmas and Thanksgiving holidays, they had, I mean, just literally a huge feast. It was like not good for them, actually. And they all spent a lot of time in the outhouse, which you would call the latrine, the day after they had the big meal. I know that. <laughs> well, I, <laughs> they pretty much have, when they got out there, they pretty much had to do it because the whole group has to move. So if you don't want to fall in line, you don't want to participate. Then you got all your peers on you, not only just the staff, but the peers. So you want to kind of become part of the group and fit in and you don't want to be the, that one person, you know, because they all want to hike. They don't want to sit around. You got one person that's acting up, the whole group gets punished for it. Not like, no, not punishment, but punishment, but not being able to do the things that they would normally be doing. I mean, there's all these stories, horror stories. The program I worked with didn't have any. It was all, you know, EMT trained. If there was any kind of medical problems, I'd, we'd actually go out and pick them up and take them into the nearest town to the medical clinic. And the most worst thing I ever saw, I mean, was ingrown toenails were quite common because, I mean, they're out hiking and that and they're not used to it. They'd get stuff like ingrown toenails, but... Physically, I mean, they didn't like sunscreen was very important. They, I mean, I mean, they actually took care of the kids. I mean, they were there for a reason, a therapy reason. And the program has changed its name now, but it's still going very strong. And it's been what a good fifteen years since I was there. So I know they quit doing the adult program. I think here, and they're just doing. They got things seven adolescent groups now but there is all the horror stories out there of all these groups there is some other programs in our area that were a lot more harsh than we were there was one that they have hand carts that they make them do another program that yeah that they would hike along like long ways from what i understand i don't know i wasn't involved in them you just hear about it <laughs> like pioneer hand carts they have two wheels and old wood hand cart that they you know Instead of having a backpack, you can put your backpack and stuff in the handcart, but then you gotta, you know, get the handcart up the hills and over the rocks or wherever you're going. I'm sure that would take, you know, a group effort. So I don't know. From the time we'd pick them up, the kids that I would pick up, and you know, not always there was I wasn't there was quite a few of us transporters. So every once in a while, you'd end up going to pick one up after they completed the program that you actually brought into the program, and you would just see how much more talkative, how much nicer they were to us and their respect for you. And they would talk about, you know, when they come in, they didn't really talk too much. Some of them would talk a lot, but mostly on the way out, they talk and they'd thank us for what we did. How usually a lot of them would apologize for the way they behaved when we brought them in. And we'd just say, yeah, we know, we, we understand we were used to it. So, but I, I mean, everybody that I had a dealing with on both ends was good. There was one kid that we had that was, dad was very, very wealthy and famous. And I felt sorry for the kid. And he was in the program for over a year. He was out there and he was really bad, really difficult. And they would keep switching him from one of the adolescent boys groups to the other one to give the other kids a break from him. And he just acted out and it's because 
he didn't have parents. His parents, I mean, he was brought up by like a nanny or housekeepers or whatever, and he didn't really have any involvement with his parents. And I think he acted up a lot because he had a family, more of a family life there than he'd ever had, so he didn't want to leave. And that's what I got from that situation. So the question is, if I had a kid and they had problems, would, they, would I send them to a program like that? I would say no. But I was also beat around the juvenile court system and mistreated by the system and kind of screwed over when I was younger. I mean, I was liked to party and didn't like school, but there was no reason I got sent to a boy's home, torn away from my hometown and all my friends. And I didn't, I mean, that was bad. The, the home that I was in back in, that would have been the 80s, the people were running it. The mother, the lady of the house was crazier than a cave of bats. And I think they just did it for the money. They got so much money from the state for each kid they had there. Could ask me if I, I think wilderness programs better than the boys home I was in. I couldn't tell you honestly because I was never in a wilderness program. The boys home was a joke to me, but I only seen out of seven years, two return repeat customers. I had actually in the program that I worked for, a lot of the people that were in the program ended coming back and going to work for the program as field staff. So if that tells you anything about it, I mean, they're sent there for misbehaving of some kind, problems, and had such a great experience, they went home and decided to go to school and, that, and come back and went to work for the company. So. So now you have a little insight firsthand from a transporter in the troubled teen wilderness industry. As you heard Travis say, he didn't have the same amount of contact with the kids as the counselors did, but what little contact he had was often traumatic, not just for the kids, but for him. I can't really imagine what it must feel like to get snatched in the middle of the night out of your house. That alone, if you ask me, is wrong. That's my opinion. I don't think taking a kid who is already dealing with issues and literally kidnapping them is going to do anything but cause more trauma, more issues for them to deal with later on. It's quite a violent act when you really stop and think about it. And I am of the firm position. You do not teach kids anything with violence except more violence. I don't know how many of you are on my TikTok, but months ago I made a video denouncing a man who slapped his teenage granddaughter in the grocery store. And then I spent the next week fending off literally tens of thousands of angry, child abusers claiming that hitting a kid is an abuse. Really? That's interesting. Why don't you walk up to a cop and hit your kid across the face in front of that cop and see what happens to you? And then come and tell me that it's not abuse and it's not illegal. Violence is never the answer. It never has been the answer. There has to be a better way to get these kids into treatment and there has to be a better way to ensure the treatment they're getting is effective and safe. I did a lot of reading while researching this issue because like I said, it's something we're going to talk about in a series. I found this chart that I thought was interesting. It's called the Theory of Change Diagram. This diagram is included in an article published by the National Library of Medicine. As you can see, the diagram reads that if a troubled teen participates in the program, they gain self-competence, emotional control, and improve life skills. The article then goes on to say that the last true study done of TTI wilderness programs was done in the year 2000, and that this new study aims to update the findings. So this study that I'm talking about, this newer one, is not finished, it's ongoing. So I went to other studies. Depending on which study you reference, wilderness programs tend to look on paper to be much more successful than group youth homes. Some websites claim 97% of parents and adolescents say their wilderness experience was success. Bullshit. I don't believe that for a second. You can't get 97% of people to agree which bread is best to make sandwiches on. So I am calling bullshit on that number. But I will say, as I continue to look through the pages and pages of statistics, it really does appear that about 80% of parents and almost 85% of adolescents who attended the wilderness programs feel that that wilderness program was beneficial for them in the long run. These programs cost between five and $600 a day, a day. 
So who can afford that? People mortgage their homes, they sell things, they do anything they have to do to get their kid into this program. And when you really think about it, the costs are very high. I pay my therapist 150 bucks an hour. These kids are with a licensed therapist three times a week, sometimes more. Then there are the staff members living in the wilderness with them and they're all making like 30 bucks an hour. You have food, you have gas money for the transporters like Travis, and then you have their salaries. You have gas to drive supplies back and forth to the camp every other day, and then you have the insurance. I know firsthand from my experience as a paralegal that there are insurance companies that will no longer write policies for TTI companies. It's just too expensive. These youth programs are getting sued so often insurance companies don't even want to insure them. So that of course means that the insurance premiums for these companies are through the roof. These are the multiple reasons why it's so expensive. One of the studies that I read that seemed to be one of the least biased included information from John Weitz, a professor of psychology at Harvard. He specializes in mental health interventions for children and adolescents. And in this article, he says, from the state of evidence that I've seen, we really don't know whether wilderness therapy has beneficial effects or not. And then he goes on to say that there is just simply a lack of scientific evidence for or against, and that it's something that needs a lot more research. Now, if I'm paying 600 bucks a day, I'm gonna need some proof that this thing actually works, you know? But I also understand how desperate I would be if I had a kid that I was afraid was gonna die, was gonna do something that was gonna end up with their death or them in prison. Now, I said in the beginning of this episode that a letter to the editor was published in our local paper on the day I was deciding to research these stories. And I'm gonna share that with you. But that letter is about residential treatment homes, so I'm going to save it for an episode that we're gonna do on the homes. In the meantime, if you have access to Netflix, I would suggest watching the program. I would really like your input if you watch it. How did it make you feel? What did it make you think about? You know why I'm here. I'm here for the conversation, be it about criminals or police or dark stories or how we can stay safer or do better. It's always about the conversation. I'm just the person who starts it. I always want to know how you feel on the topics that we cover, and I think this is an important one, and one that we've just kind of seen the tip of the iceberg on. I think in the coming years, we are going to see more and more horror stories coming from adults who were kids not very long ago, kids that experienced some really horrible things inside the TTI, and their stories matter. We need to listen to those stories. We have to. How else are we ever going to learn how to do better? Thank you for joining me today on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and you can join my Patreon. For a few dollars a month, you help keep the videos coming, and we have a very important goal there. We are currently in the midst of a fundraiser. This is the thumbnail for the video that explains all about the fundraiser to you. We are raising money in hopes of solving some cold cases. So go watch the video, and if you can donate a little bit of money, it will go directly to that cause. You don't have to donate 20 bucks you can donate a dollar. I would love it if everybody donated a dollar. I hope you're doing well. Please know that I really look forward to conversing with you all in the comments, and I'm really glad that you're here and appreciate your support. Stay safe, my friends, and be kind to each other, and I will see you next time on Dark Hearts with Stacey Lee. Bye.